Why? Because just down the street, you see that there's a boarding house. That is uh, my mother's boarding house. And she calls it Ethelbert Cottage. And we're not getting much business. But if you name your horse Ethelbert and he starts winning, people will ask you, where did you get that silly name? And you'll tell them about our cottage and we'll get more business. <laughs> and Arkell is amused by that. Uh, he does not sell the horse. He names it Ethelbert and it begins to win. In fact, it will win him by when all is said and done, $200,000. Ten years pass, and W.J. Arkell is in an exclusive restaurant on Broadway in New York. And this gorgeous woman, dressed to the nines, comes sweeping in, sits down right next to him, and says, Mr. Arkell, it is good to see you again. You haven't changed a bit. And he says, who are you? She said, well, I'll tell you who I am in a moment. But first of all, I must tell you what I owe to you. <clears throat> Remember ten years ago, when you were trying to name that horse? I was the little girl on the porch that suggested the name Ethelbert. And it worked. People began to come to my mother's boarding house. And one of them was a theatrical agent who heard me playing the piano and singing. And the long and the short of it is, because of him and because of you, I have made a career in show business, and I am the hottest thing on Broadway right now. <laughs> and he says, still, who are you? She said, my name is Billy Burke. Now, a lot of people don't know who Billy Burke is. She was a singer and a dancer, did many Broadway shows. She was a comedian, way ahead of her time. And she also did some films. And I guarantee you have seen her in at least one film. She portrayed Glinda, the good witch, in The Wizard of Oz, <laughs> Billy Burke, whose career began really through W.J. Arkell. So that's one of the stories Arkell tells in this book. Now, Mr. Arkell, uh, I can't swear that he liked fast cars and fast women, but I know he liked fast cars. He tells a story. He had a Mercedes. This is, he does, does not give a year, which is frustrating. But he has a Mercedes. And he says that for a little while, he held the record uh, for speed in a Mercedes. He was the first man to drive one mile in one minute in a Mercedes. This happened in Florida. And another rich gentleman, also a Mercedes owner, became very jealous and said, Arkell, I am going to beat that record. So his rival hops in his Mercedes, and Arkell kind of thinks he wants to go along on this, this ride. But there's, a, there's another fellow who says, no, 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 no. You, Arkell, you've already had your ride. You set the record. I want to be in this car when my friend beats your record. They flip a coin. Arkell does not get to ride in his rival's car. The rival takes off down the beach, I think. Tire blows, car flips over. The two people in the car killed. W.J. Arkell came that close to dying in a Mercedes, which I don't think he would have mind, actually, as I, as I got to know him reading his book. He, uh, he admired many people, and he talks about them in his book. We can learn a lot about a person from the people he admires. Here's one of the stories Arkell tells. It is about P.T. Barnum. Uh, P.T. Barnum and Bailey Circus uh, are set up in Madison Square Garden and all around the garden, all the, the neighboring streets, there are big banners with paintings, you know, of lions and tigers and bears, oh my, and ringmasters and clowns. And Mr. Barnum is making sure everything's installed properly. He's walking around and he sees a young man just staring at the banners, and maybe even taking notes. And uh, clearly this young man is interested, so uh, Barnum takes him aside, walks him all around, making sure he sees all these beautiful banners advertising the show. And then the young man says, well, you know, it says here, uh, you know, an, an Indian lion. Uh, I know a lot about 
Indian lions and their habitat and begins to tell Barnum a story. And Barnum suddenly wakes up to the idea that this kid knows everything about wild animals. And that with his input, their advertising could be much better. So Barnum grabs this young man, scurries over to the offices of the Barnum and Bailey circuses, sits down with his partner Bailey and says, fire our current advertising manager. This young man will be our new advertising manager. To which Bailey says, he already is our advertising manager. Mr. Barnum had offered this new young man $10,000 a year. <clears throat> His salary had been $7,500. So Barnum's a little embarrassed and chagrined, and, but he feels in all... Well, he's been caught. He has to pay this young man a higher salary now because he blundered. This is a wonderful story. It hits the New York newspapers. It travels all over America. P.T. Barnum. You know, a fool. Turns out the story was false. P.T. Barnum had written it himself and had paid a New York newspaper a dollar a line to publish it, and it was picked up around the country as a true story. It was an advertising gimmick for the Barnum and Bailey Circus. W.J.R. Kell admires this. So you will not be surprised at the next story. Now, Arkell had several really mainline, honest businesses. Uh, among other things, he owned at one point Frank Leslie's Illustrated newspaper. But he also owned a newspaper called Judge. And I have a copy of one of the Judge uh, covers here. It is really hard to describe what Judge Magazine was. The cartoonists that he hired were highly skilled. They did a lot of political cartooning. They did a lot of just absurd, silly stuff. It had some serious articles, but Judge Magazine, when you get right down to it, in my view, was a cross between The New Yorker and Mad Magazine. <laughs> it was strange. But W.J. Arkell loved it. And here is what happened. W.J. Arkell convinced a congressman to bring a, a bill before Congress which would allow Arkell to pay the government two million dollars for the privilege of putting ads for Judge Magazine on the back of postage stamps. This is in the days when you actually had to lick the postage stamps. You, you would look at the rear of it for a second anyway. The country was horrified. How could a private company have advertising on U.S. postage stamps? And th th there were investigations, calls for congressional hearings, uh, it, uh, an uproar. It was set a very dangerous precedent. Well, in the end, Arkell convinced another congressman to bring up a bill making this impossible to actually make it illegal for advertising to be on the back of postage stamps. Again, this was all bogus. Arkell never had any money to spend on this. It was a complete fabrication. But the country thought it was real. And he got so much publicity out of it, he beamed about it till the day he died. He said people would be yelling and screaming about Judge Magazine and they'd never read it, they'd never seen it. So to make sure their arguments held water, they went out and they bought a copy or two, just to know what to complain about. He said it was great for business, and it was a complete lie. That was W.J.R. Kell. He had some views on politics. Uh, William McKinley, President McKinley, was convinced that one of the political cartoons in the Judge magazine tipped the presidential election for him. And he was so grateful to Arkell, he offered Arkell a post in his cabinet, Postmaster General. Think what Arkell could have done with all the postage stamps as Postmaster General. But Arkell turned down the job, saying, I have a national reputation as a jokester and a funny man, and, and I fear that the opposition press would tag me 
as the clown of the cabinet, and this would reflect poorly on President McKinley's judgment. So he turned it down, did not serve in the cabinet. Arkell's views on politics, he quoted a politician of the era named Chauncey Depew. See if this sounds at all familiar. Here's what Arkell says about American politics. Only two classes of persons are available for public office. These are the ultra-rich, who can expend hundreds of thousands of dollars for a paid organization and general corruption, and the demagogues, who can appeal to the ignorance, prejudice, and passions of the masses. The poor man, with nothing but character and qualifications, is absolutely out of the running for the American presidency. Here's how he evaluated two politicians. Grover, Cle Grover Cleveland, two presidents. He said, Mr. Cle Mr. Cleveland was the most independent president this country ever had after he secured office. Before he was elected, he could promise about as much as any man I ever knew and forget his promises afterward. Of Calvin Coolidge, Mr. R. Cal prophesied I believe that Calvin Coolidge will go down in history as the greatest president since Lincoln. Didn't quite work out that way. The, uh, this book, Old Friends and Some Acquaintances, he does talk about being here at Grant Cottage when General Grant and the family were here. And he tells a few stories. Uh, many people came up to pay their respects to Grant. Most were not let in because the doctors did not want him distracted. But on a particular day, uh, a stranger got off the train, uh, a black man with a southern accent. And he found Mr. Arkell and he asked if it would be all right to come in and say hello to General Grant. And this uh, black uh, man was saying, I served under him during the war. Arkell ducks in, confers with Grant, comes out, and says yes. Uh, the general will see you now. He goes in with him. Grant looks at the stranger, kind of recognizes him, not can't quite place him, and, and he wonders, were you in the uh, United States colored troops that I, I led? And uh, this stranger says, well, no, I was in what I hoped was the safest place I could be during the war. I was your cook. Grant and this uh, man who had come up from the South had a, a a very nice reunion, and Mr. Arkell uh, orchestrated that. One day, Arkell is sitting on the porch with Grant and Grant's eldest grandchild, little Julia. Believe it or not, on this porch, a chicken ran by, being chased by a rooster. And little Julia says to her grandfather, Grandpapa, I bet that rooster could catch that chicken if the chicken wanted to be caught. And Grant started to laugh. He started to choke. He had cancer of the throat. He could barely breathe. He started choking so hard and laughing so hard, Arkell thought he was going to die right here on the porch. But in the end, he finally was able to breathe again. He did not pass out. But Arkell was here watching the family for most of that summer. The greatest moment, I think, of Arkell's stay here. After Grant died, the funeral arrangements were uh, orchestrated by the U.S. Army. And the man in charge was a fellow named, you might have heard of him, General Winfield Scott Hancock, hero of the Battle of Gettysburg. But before Hancock got here, Arkell was handling the day-to-day uh, situation for the family, which was in mourning. And he sent many uh, telegrams to uh, General Hancock in those first few days. Finally, Hancock gets here. He comes up on the porch. Arkell is seated here next to his friend, uh, Joseph Drexel. Now, Drexel is a, a partner in the hotel. Technically, this is Mr. Drexel's cottage. But Arkell and Drexel are old friends. They're seated here. Hancock knows Drexel, so he comes up to Drexel and he says, Who is this idiot, Arkell, that keeps sending me telegrams every ten minutes? 
Drexel's a little embarrassed because Arkell's seated right there. <laughs> he introduces Arkell and Hancock, and Arkell decides he's going to yank the general's chain a little bit. <laughs> he says to Hancock, I, uh, I understand you're a general. Army or Navy? And Hancock goes ballistic, storms into the cottage. Arkell is unprepared for that reaction. He thought it was a nice little joke. But in the end, Drexel dragged them back together, and they sorted things out. But Arkell had no real respect for a person's uh, status. Uh, there's a story, the first caretaker here at Grant Cottage, a veteran of the Union Army, a guy named Oliver Clark, had been captured at Cold Harbor, imprisoned at Andersonville. Quite a story. Anyway, Clark is the first caretaker here. It takes the state of New York quite a while to start contributing funds to the upkeep of the cottage. But finally, somebody in the state government thinks, well, you know, the state of New York is giving money to Grant Cottage. The caretaker should pass a civil service test. Mr. Arkell hears about that, and he writes to the bureaucrats in Albany saying, I see no reason why Mr. Clark should have to take a civil service exam. I know you people. I know the kinds of questions you ask. You will ask him to name the islands in the Nile River and in the Mediterranean. You will ask for a definition of hypothesis. Mr. Clark cannot pass an exam with questions like that, and neither can I, and neither can any of the members of my board, which actually owns Grant Cottage now. At this point, Arkell is one of the 20 richest men in America. This letter got their attention, and his sarcasm really got their attention. Mr. Clark did not have to pass a civil service exam, thanks to Mr. Arkell. Okay. Mr. Arkell would go on to write at least two books, two novels. One I have not found a copy of. It's called A Philosopher in Love and in Uniform. I someday will find a copy of this. He also wrote a novel, and I think maybe next year I'm going to do a porch chat just on this. I'm just going to mention it to you in passing. It is called Napoleon Smith. And it is what we would call a historical novel. You know, where fictional characters interact with real people from the past. Arkell, he had some help with this one. I mean, his, his little autobiography, I don't give him points for style at all. But this, this is pretty cool. His, uh, and I'll, I'll just very quickly mention uh, an example of how he blends history and fiction. But the setting for this book is Paris in 1870 during the Franco-Prussian War when the Germans have surrounded Paris and Paris is under siege. His hero, Napoleon Smith, a veteran of our Civil War, an American, utterly believes that he is the grandson of the real Napoleon. And he has come to Paris to find a hidden treasure, a treasure left by his grandpa, Napoleon. So he stops in at the American embassy for help. That's where the story begins. Now, in the details, the historical figures that were real, well, Grant is mentioned in the book for sure, but are any of you from Albany? Anybody from Albany? Maybe you have heard at least of a park in Albany called Swinburne Park. It's named after uh, an, an Albany mayor. It turns out that Napoleon Smith, in 1870, during the siege of Paris, meets a fellow named John Swinburne, who is a veteran of our Civil War, a surgeon, happened to be in Paris when the siege began, and set up an ambulance corps and a field hospital, which would take all comers. The Americans were neutral, so this Civil War surgeon, Swinburne, does something nobody else can do. He sets up a hospital operation that will help the German wounded as well as the French wounded, French civilians. There are a few German civilians in the city. It will help them. 
He's mentioned in passing as a small character. John Swinburne was really there. This guy who would come home, become the mayor of Albany, and have a park named after him. So Arkell did some research, which is really kind of surprising to me. Uh, his book was published in the 1880s, before we got this idea of historical novels. Uh, but next year, you know, I'm thinking, since General Grant is a mentioned in here, maybe I could tie Grant into a book review. I could call it General Grant's Imaginary Friends. Check our website. I'm not sure I'll go with that title, but I probably will do a book review sooner or later. Uh, this is one of those hot days. I could rattle on uh, a bit longer, but I think for my own sake, if not yours, uh, this is enough. Uh, I need a break. I need more water. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll hang around. If you'd like to take a look at the storyboards, quite welcome to do that. And thank you for bearing this heat. I uh, wasn't sure anybody would show up. So a toast to you. Thank you. Cottage is much cooler. If you want to take a tour, now would be a great time. <laughs> or I could.